Good morning. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, open our hearts to learn your, the wisdom you gave Howard Thurman so we may hear your voice in your silence. Welcome to Loretta Coleman Brown's presentation of Howard Thurman, an active contemplative. I am Maggie Winfrey, coordinator of Contemplative Outreach Atlanta, our fellow Contemplative Outreach chapters from Chicago, Colorado, Maryland, and Washington join us in co-sponsoring this event. We are deeply honored to host Loretta, whose research on Howard Thurman will inspire our spiritual journey. She is a professor emerita of psychology from Agnes Scott College, a spiritual director companion, writer, retreat leader, and speaker. She earned her BA from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and PhD from Harvard University. She completed the spiritual guidance program at the Shalem Institute for Spiritual Formation. She promotes contemplative spirituality, the living wisdom of Howard Thurman. By uncovering the peace and joy in one's heart, you can find more information at her website, loretacolemanbrown.com and other social media platforms. She appears in the documentaries, Backs Against the Wall, The Howard Thurman Story, and The Black Church, This Is Our Story, This Is Our Song. Her book, When the Heart Speaks, Listen, Discovering the Inner Wisdom, was published in 2019. We are excited that her newest book is now coming out, What Makes You Come Alive, A Spiritual Walk with Howard Thurman. I've started reading it and just love it. Loretta is a most grateful heart transplant recipient for 28 years and kidney transplant for 17 years and several other medical ordeals. In spite of all this, she brings us wisdom. Welcome, Loretta. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you, Maggie. And hello to all of you. I, I've just been reading the chat and I can't believe people from all over the place. I mean, middle Wisconsin and Texas and South Alabama. So welcome this morning. I'm sure that wherever you are, it's probably a little chilly, um, but I'm, I think that we will be warmed in the next couple of hours by some of the work and um, some of the, the uh, writings of Howard Thurman. So I'm going to share my screen um, and uh, we're going to uh, begin this morning with a, uh, um, a meditation um, by him to, to help us begin our um, uh, sit. And uh, somehow or other I've got chat on here. So let us. One of the first things that I did want to mention is that we may hear some gender bias in the language of uh, Howard Thurman's prayers and meditations and work. Uh, and this is a statement that is included and in, in, at the beginning of many of his books. Um, it says, we realize that the inclusive language is notably absent in the Howard Thurman writings. As gifted and prophetic as he was, Howard Thurman also, it also was a product of his times and inclusive language was not a part of that consciousness. Regardless of the language, the substance of Howard Thurman's work is inclusive. His life and theology were inclusive. And if he were writing today, his language would more accurately reflect his worldview. So uh, we will see that uh, uh, there is uh, that, that uh, noticeable gender difference there. So our opening meditation, which uh, as, as you know, one as aspect of this will include a 20 minutes of sitting. Um, our opening meditation um, is taken from a prayer uh, at the beginning of a uh, sermon that he gave 
um, on, and I, as you see, I'm trying to bracket it, which is really, really uh, originally uh, men who have walked with God, <clears throat> uh, the mystics, but I sort of bracketed as people who have walked with God. And he, he actually studied several uh, uh, female uh, mystics as well. So this is taken from the archives, the Howard Thurman Digital Archives, which you can access just by going online. This is from the Pitt Library um, at the Candler School of Theology um, at Emory University. And so we're going to uh, listen here to his uh, prayer. And then we will automatically go, Maggie will ring the bell at the end because he'll say an amen. And then we will sit for 20 minutes. There is so much that engages the mind. And ensnares the emotions that again and again we are wanderers lost in the midst of our own private and collective wildernesses. with no sense of being at home anywhere in anything at any time. Our enthusiasms wax hot and cold. <clears throat> One day life is full and the wave is high and the sun is bright. And the hours pass quickly. And we seem no longer Fred. And then the next day. The day is long. Dreary. And we wonder how it felt to ride with freedom and abandon on the crest of the wave. It is wonderful, therefore, to sit together. to be enveloped by a single moment. And feel the presence and sense the lights and the shadows in the lives of those who sit next to us. It is good to be caught up in the creative silence, surrounded by the brooding presence of God. And perchance as we wait together in the quietness, some new light may be thrown upon old problems. Some fresh hope may give wings to spirits to which despair is the familiar. Perhaps a sense of forgiveness for sins committed, for errors done, for blundering stupidities, 
that have wrought havoc in other people's lives. All this may be the miracle for us as we wait together in the quietness. Oh, love of God, without which life has no meaning, and no harbor. Leave us not alone with our little lives, our broken dreams, our insistent problems. but invade our spirits with thy vitality that we may be renewed in all the ways of our life, that we may turn from this place this day with all that is within us, wash, purify, and refreshed. We seek this with simplicity apart and with quiet faith and confidence. Thou wilt not deny thy love to thy children. <clears throat> O oh God, our Father. Amen. Thank you.
Thank you so much for that quiet time. Um, I want to begin by actually thanking Maggie and John and Chris who have been working uh, with me and all of us together as a team um, to uh, bring this program with you to you today. It's it's amazing what it takes in the background for things to happen, and uh, I really appreciate all the efforts that they have been putting forth the last few days, getting everything together. And I always like to begin my presentations by thanking um, Professor um, Walter Earl Fluker, um, Professor Peter Eisenstadt, and Professor Luther Smith Jr., as well as uh, Kai Jackson, for all and the many uh, Thurman scholars who have just created a beautiful treasure trove of materials for people like me who lead retreats um, and, uh, and who need to write books without spending hours in the library. Uh, it's just an amazing array of materials, particularly uh, the now five volumes of the Howard Thurman's Papers Project. There's actually, it's, it's just these resources are, are amazing. Um, so in the spirit of Howard Thurman, who was, I believe, born a contemplative, uh, I uh, want to encourage us all to ignore our electronic devices for the next couple of hours. Um, and trust that God will be able to take care of whatever it is that um, is needed. So uh, I want to begin with my own connections to Howard Thurman. I actually uh, discovered him late in life, um, which was an issue that bothered me immensely. I couldn't understand how I had been studying by that point. Spirituality for 30 years had attended predominantly black churches, all kinds of spiritual retreats. And I had actually never heard of him. Actually, I was uh, uh, finishing up my program at Shalane and I wanted to write about um, a mystic. And so I started asking around about um, African and African-American mystics. Um, and one of my clergy friends told me about Howard Thurman and, and I started to read his Meditations of the Heart and. I just, I was astounded. So, uh, but as I uh, got into his work, particularly his um, autobiography uh, with head and heart, the autobiography of Howard Thurman, I realized that we were very much connected, although perhaps maybe 50 years apart in terms of our um, lifetimes. And uh, I also was a person who was drawn to, um, the outside. He liked being outside in nature, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, I was, I loved uh, sitting out in the wind. And um, I think that my family and some of the friends of the family thought I was a little strange um, for sitting out there. And they would, you know, sort of ask my parents, what is she doing out there? And um, they would, you know, I wasn't doing anything. I was actually just experiencing what I, what I now know was the presence of God. I didn't have the words at that point to know that. But um, so as I read about his life, I realized that we were definitely um, uh, very much connected. Uh, and um, I also believe that he was uh, uh, perhaps born even a mystic. Um, I know that I have some definite mystical uh, leanings, uh, but I think he was one of those people that just uh, didn't have, again, the words for it, but was having those experiences. So um, Howard Thurman is often described as an American sage who integrated his religious inheritance from the black church with various Christian mystical tra traditions, American pragmatist philosophy, and the ethical ideas of the social gospel movement to form a distinctive intercultural, interracial um, ministerial uh, witness. Now, just to um, talk briefly about uh, uh, the his timeline, 
Um, we know that he was born somewhere near um, West Palm Beach, Florida um, on November 18th, 1899. Um, he, the family then moved to Daytona Beach, Florida. Uh, he was raised primarily by his mother and grandmother um, who had been a former slave after his father dies of pneumonia when Howard Thurman was about seven years of age. And this death of his father was really um, a very uh, big turning point for him, not only because he happened to be in the room at the time, but because he, um, the, the local Baptist church, which he attended with his mother and grandmother, uh, refused to host the funeral because they said that uh, he was, um, and I should say Saul Thurman was not a person who was particularly religious, but more uh, intellectual type and read a lot, but he did not attend the local church. And so they said because he was not a churchgoer and because he uh, was, as they described him, uh, died outside of Christ, they refused to host it. Uh, a a uh, traveling minister uh, said that he would, but in his eulogy, he condemned Thurman's father to hell for not going to church. And of course, Howard Thurman was really ready to um, just uh, uh, give up going to church. And of course, he couldn't do that. Um, but he said when he became an adult, he was not going to, he was never going to attend church. However, he kept having these um, mystical experiences. So I assume that, that uh, you all have uh, many of these, uh, this timeline, and you can read uh, uh, part of his uh his story there. So here is the childhood home of Howard Thurman. It's been preserved. Um, it is um, in Daytona Beach, Florida. And um, he basically uh, uh, grew up in a, a, a much more rural area than it is now. It's not necessarily uh, populated, but it's still very much rural. Um, and um, he actually began to um, walk along the the, uh, the beaches of Daytona Beach. He also spent a lot of time rowing um, along the Halifax River. Um, and he says this about how he got into uh, his contemplative life. He says, I was a very sensitive child who suffered much from the violences of racial conflict. The climate of our town, Daytona Beach, Florida, was better than most Southern towns because of the influence of the tourists who wintered there. Nevertheless, life became more and more suffocating because of the fear of being brutalized, beaten, or otherwise outraged. In my effort to keep this fear from corroding my life and making me seek relief in shiftlessness, I sought help from God. I found that the more I turned to prayer, to what I discovered in later years to be meditation, the more time I spent alone in the woods or on the beach, the freer became my own spirit and the more realistic became my ambitions to get an education. So here we have this young uh, black boy um, in the early 1900s meditating. Um, and it's just, you know, an extraordinary story to think that that's what he was doing. Now, there was um, a particular tree um, that Thurman uh, became attached to. Um, and as a matter of fact, he says that um, he spent some time uh, talking with this tree. Um, and it's, it's very interesting that um, not only uh, did he have this connection, deep, deep connection to, to, um, to nature, but um, you know, to sort of all life in some ways. So he says um, about the tree, um, I would hold, uh, he said, um, I, I needed this tree. I needed the strength of the tree. Um, because I learned that from the oak tree, despite the tempest, the storms that would come over out, and out of the ocean, it stood stalwart. Um, and he felt like that there was some kind of constancy there in, in this tree. He also said 
that um, I needed the strength of the tree and like it, I would hold my ground. Um, I cultivated a unique relationship with the tree. I could sit my back against the trunk and feel the same peace that would come to me in my bed at night. I would reach down in the quiet places of my spirit, take out my bruises and my joys, unfold them and talk about them. I could talk aloud to the oak tree and know that it understood. It too was a part of my reality, like the woods, the night and the pounding surf, my earliest companions giving me space. Um, remarkably, uh, Thurman had lots of experiences in, like I said, in this area uh, around the ocean with respect to trees. Um, and uh, he, he actually wrote uh, about them in uh, his, uh, his autobiography where he says that, for example, he says, the ocean and the night together surrounded my life with a reassurance that could not be affronted by the behavior of human beings. The ocean gave at night gave me a sense of timelessness, of existing beyond the reach of the ebb and flow of circumstances. Death would be a minor thing. I felt in the, in, in, in the sweep of the natural embrace, um, these, the, this, the experience of these storms gave me a certain overriding immunity against much of the pain with which I would have to deal with in the years ahead when the ocean was only a memory. The sense held, I felt rooted in life, in nature and existence. Um, and he also says, as I walked along the beach of the Atlanta, um, Atlantic in the quiet stillness that only can be completely felt when the murmur of the ocean is stilled and the tides move stealthily along the shore. I held my breath against the night and watched the stars etch their brightness on the face of the darkened canopy of the heavens. I had the sense that all things, the sand, the sea, the stars, the night, and I were one lung through which all of life breathed. Not only was I aware of the vast rhythm enveloping all, but I was a part of it and it was a part of me. So he, in many ways, were, was having these not only contemplative experiences, but mystical experiences as a young child um, in, uh, outside in uh, Daytona Beach. We believe this tree is still there. Um, and this was a, a, a picture taken um, by my husband as we visited the house a few years back. Um, and it is a mighty oak tree. It's, you know, from the side, it may look like it's thinned, but it is really very, very big tree. Now, another big influence in Thurman's life um, growing up as a child was his grandmother, um, Lady Nancy Ambrose. Um, and because his mother, of course, after his father passed away, um, his mother had to work. Um, his grandmother um, spent a lot of time with um, the children. So Howard Thurman had an older sister um, and a younger sister. Uh, and uh, he said sometimes it was kind of fun having the older one or the younger one because he could blame either one if something happened. <laughs> but basically um, his grandmother um, uh, who had been born a slave um, very much wanted Howard and his sisters to get an education because when she was coming along, she was not a allowed to learn how to read. And she, 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 had, she, she used to tell them this, one of the stories of um, how her um, slave master's daughter tried to teach her to read and she got in a lot of trouble because she, uh, the, the young girl was trying to help her, but you know, she, uh, uh, she, she knew that there was a, a secret there, that there was something important about learning how to read. So, but because she couldn't read, she had um, Howard to read often the Bible to her. And it was very interesting. She would, she would have him read certain sections. Um, she particularly liked the Psalms, 
Um, but there were certain Pauline letters that she would not allow him to read um, to her. Um, mostly those that had to do with slaves obeying their masters. Um, but she was uh, certainly uh, one who um, instilled in him and modeled for him uh, what, she, what spirituality was. She, she sort of lived her spirituality. She was well-respected in the community for um, her strength and her wisdom. Um, she was a laundress and a midwife. Um, and any time that she thought that Howard and his sisters were losing, you know, sort of that glimmer in their eyes or that sense of confidence, because as they were getting older, they were learning more and more about their, their um, second class citizenship in the Jim Crow South. And um, so she would tell them this story about how uh, once a year um, there was a slave preacher who um, was allowed to come and preach to them. And he would give a sermon. And at the end of the sermon, he would look at each one of them in the eyes and say, you are not enslaved people. You are not the N-word. You are a child of God, a holy child of God. And it was that, that sense of being a child of God that actually helped her to get through the horror of slavery. And so Thurman, being the bright, inquisitive young boy that he was, understood that that was something to hold on to. She wanted that idea, being a child of God, being a holy child of God, to be his primary identity. So that when other people came along and told him things, because as we know, how we learn about ourselves um, is through what other people tell us um, growing up. Um, so she wanted that to not only be his primary identity, but to help inoculate him from some of the negative um, information that he would eventually learn about himself um, uh, as he went along. This picture of young Howard Thurman, he was a very bright young man. Um, and at the time um, in Daytona Beach and in the state of Florida, um, they only provided education for uh, black children to the to age to grade seven, uh, which de facto meant that they were not going to be able to go to high school. There were about two uh, residential high schools for uh, black children in the state of Florida. Um, and so what the community did was to come together and to basically um, have Thurman tutored by the local principal so that he could pass the eighth grade exam. Um, and so he was able to pass that exam and then went on to go to the Florida Baptist Academy, which is by the way now um, Florida Memorial College. Um, and uh, Thurman being the bright young man that he was, of course, graduated from his class as valedictorian. Um, and because he graduated from his class as valedictorian, he was able to receive a tuition um, scholarship to Morehouse College here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and he graduated as valedictorian from his class at Morehouse. Um, and it is said, and we're not quite sure if the rumor is true, that he read every book in the library at the time. He also took um, a course in philosophy at Columbia during one of the summers. Um, he majored in sociology and economics um, because he was told by one of his mentors that if he was going to go to seminary, that he might as well take his sort of religious studies classes there because he was going to either have to take them again, et cetera. So he was admitted to Rochester. It's now Colgate Rochester Theological Seminary. Um, and, and, and at the time, uh, Rochester Theological Seminary would um, admit two black students each year so that they could room together. <laughs> and, and there was a big stir about one of them dropping out and uh, uh, Thurman actually uh, 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 being roommates with white students there. Um, but, uh, you know, they sort of got through that. But anyway, he graduated valedictorian of that class. So just a, a brilliant, brilliant um, young man. 
Um, he began his pastoral uh, uh, duties at the Mount Zion Baptist Church in Oberlin, Ohio. Um, and he noted actually that he would get a crowd of people from Oberlin College um, to, uh, in his, um, uh, to visit his church and listen to his sermons. Um, and uh, he uh, later moved back to more um, to Atlanta because his wife, um, Katie Kelly um, Thurman, who he married right after uh, graduating from seminary, had contracted tuberculosis. She worked in the Black branch of the per Tuberculosis Association in Atlanta. Um, her family was here um, in the area, and so he chose to leave the church and to go um, and um, secure this professorship so that she could be closer to her family. And I should mention that a few years later in 1930, she did pass away. They had one child. Um, and so he was actually a widow at age 30 with a young child. Um, but he, um, one night he was at a, um, at a, a a religious education conference and he got bored and he walked out um, to get some fresh air. And on the way out, he ran across a um, book that was on the table. Um, and he, I think he bought a couple of books, but one of them was written by Rufus Jones, who is a noted uh, Quaker um, mystic um, and professor of mysticism at Haverford College, or at the time he was. Um, and um, it was called Finding the Trail of Life. And Thurman just sat down and read the book right there. And he was so intrigued with this book because in some ways, um, which, which the book is about um, Rufus Jones's um, experiences as a child, um, his mystical experiences. He was actually in some ways describing some of the same experiences that Thurman had um, when he was a, a young boy, this sort of, sense of connection to nature and seeing God in nature and experiencing God in nature. And he thought at that time, he says, I've got to go study with this man. Um, and so uh, he basically uh, was, and I, I will call them um, holy coincidences or sacred uh, synchronicities. He was able to find someone who knew Rufus Jones was able to contact him and Rufus Jones offered him a, um, um, some housing and um, a sort of a tuition free semester to study mysticism. Um, and so, um, and I'm not sure if you all are familiar with some of the uh, uh, Quaker mystical tradition, but uh, Rufus Jones uh, was sort of born into Quaker silent worship um, and he talks about being embraced by the presence as a four-year-old. And I just want to read this from a um, uh, biography of Rufus Jones. He says, every day after breakfast, we had a long period of family silent worship during which all the older members of the group seemed to be plainly communing in joyous fellowship with a real presence. The reality of it all was so great and the certainty of something more than just ourselves in the room was so clearly felt that we little folks were caught into the experience and carried along with the others. The mystical hush had its own awe and the rapt look on the older faces deepened the sense of awe and wonder. By the time I was four, I'm gonna say that again, by the time I was four years old, I had formed the habit of using corporate silence in a heightening and effective way. It brought with it, even for the child, a sense of presence. So here we have Rufus Jones basically uh, sitting and experiencing the effects of corporate silence as a four-year-old. And I'm sure if you all are not familiar with Quaker schools, but typically every Friday, all the children in the school from kindergarten up sit for 30 minutes. So. I, I often wonder what our lives would be like if we had children sitting in silence, um, uh, you know, at school. Now, Thurman uh, mentions, because he did attend um, some of the um, unprogrammed, I learned a new word last week, it's an unprogrammed um, 
worship service where there's nothing but silence. He attended uh, those uh, fairly regularly and he writes about them. I just want to, to read this because it's just so extraordinary um, as he talks about this. He says, um, so he's basically describing his sitting in a meeting, a Quaker meeting. He says, nobody said a word, just silence, silence, silence. And in that silence, I felt as though all of them were on one side and I was on the other side by myself with my noise. And every time I would try to get across the barrier, across, nothing happened. I just was Howard Thurman. And then I don't know when it happened, how it happened. I wish I could tell you, but somewhere in that hour, I passed over the invisible line. And I became one with all the seekers. I wasn't Howard Thurman anymore. I was, I was a human spirit involved in a creative moment with human spirits in the presence of God. So basically, um, we are learning how much um, Howard Thurman uh, began to not only love but cherish sort of group or corporate silence. And he knew that there was some um, power there um, in that. So uh, as he uh, finished up his time with Rufus Jones, um, particularly experientially, um, he went on to uh, spend a couple of years, as I mentioned, at Morehouse and Spelman College. Um, as their director of religious life and professor. And then he was invited to um, become the dean of the Rankin Chapel, as well as um, the uh, uh, professor of religion um, at Howard University in Washington, DC. And we'll come back to some of the things that he uh, tried in his worship services, but not only there, but when he also um, founded an intentional, the first intentional interracial church um, in San Francisco in 1943, uh, he, he, he started to sort of experiment with um, silence. Now, if you noticed during the opening uh, prayer that he wrote, that he had those sort of moments of silence, and particularly before that last amen, there was just so he, he really felt like it was really important um, to have silence um, it, and use it in a variety of different ways. But, but what he found uh, when he instituted a pre-worship meditation period that, um, that the request for pastoral care went down. So he says, this quiet period became one of the most dynamic sources of vitality in the life of the church. Again and again, the quality of the first period of meditation would carry over into the briefer second meditation during the morning service. The earlier period was also useful because often there came to individuals illuminations of their own problems, which made it unnecessary for them to seek any other help. So for Thurman, there was something healing about silence. And I think he would probably even say further something particularly healing about group or congregation of silence. That when you bring an entire group of people together as we have today or in a larger setting of a church and have them sit in silence, that something healing can happen. Um, and in this case, he found that um, people didn't necessarily have to come to him for help, that sometimes the help came in the midst of the silence. And he refers to that again in that opening meditation, that we might, you know, that we might be washed, that we might receive vitality, that we might um, be healed, that we might be forgiven in this time of quiet together. So this pre-worship meditation period uh, was really important. And not only did he use that in the church in San Francisco, but he took that with him when he became 
um, the first black faculty member and Dean of the Marsh Chapel at Boston University. Silence was really important. And if any of you have had uh, an opportunity to read his Meditations of the Heart, his first section of those meditations are devoted to silence. Uh, and um, he believed that every day, he, he has one meditation called a lull in doing. He believed that every day there should be some time set aside for silence. He also uh, had this way of, of um, using silence in a creative way. So he says, I used silence to engage in visits with the sick who remained in the cities um, once he had moved. Howard Thurman recounts the story of uh, his praying with uh, another uh, person living in another state by telling her that he would meet her in the silence twice a week at an agreed upon time. Each time I came home for a visit, we would share our experiences. Now, this is something that I'm actually going to experiment with uh, during Lent this year. I've actually started um, gathering a group um, or at least um, uh, a few people together to, um, to be able to try this um, and see what happens. Um, wouldn't it be nice again if we were perhaps maybe uh, engaged with one or two other people perhaps maybe in some other part of the country where we could come together um, and um, sit um, for a certain amount of time, maybe 20 minutes, maybe more, um, and then see what happens. Um, I just think that uh, he you know, tried to, uh, uh, to find creative ways to um, experience uh, silence, which was very important to him. Now, I should also mention, though, that for Thurman, um, contemplation wasn't just silence, solitude, and stillness. It was also about sparking um, uh, the presence of God or, or creating circumstances where people might be able to experience the presence of God. So, for example, um, he believed that spirituality could not be taught, but it could be caught like a contagion. And so he tried to do various things, like often he would have either dramatic performances or literature. He would read all kinds of literature to see if he could then spark the presence um, uh, during um, a, a worship service. He used music. It could be spirituals, it could be classical music, it could be calming music. You know, I, I have not yet heard any jazz, but you know, who knows? Uh, but but he, he, again, would sometimes play music. He would sometimes do this actually in class as well, where he would play some kind of music for some, some group of students, read Psalm 139 or some other Psalm. Um, and uh, he would, would ask them then to reflect on their experience. He had live Madonnas. He was using live Madonnas in, and we're talking early 30s, um, you know, 40s, where he would have someone in costume hold a live baby with uh, lights, everything and just have people to just be with this. Um, again, um, interested in sparking um, a presence of God. And then of course, liturgical dance. I mean, I think a lot of us think of liturgical dance as something new. Uh, he was using liturgical dance in the thirties. Uh, again, to try to create a sense of presence. Um, and sometimes people would remark, I mean, even with his, uh, his sermons, and if you listen to him, he could spark something in you. So, you know, this leads us to some questions that we may want to, um, um, to sit with. And that is, um, you know, where do we meet the presence? You know, yes, it is important. I, I'm a strong advocate of um, sitting, of um, having some time for silence, of, 
of quieting our minds. And by the way, Thurman really uh, made a distinction between quieting the mind and stealing the mind. He said, there's a difference between quietness and stillness. And he says, you know, Psalm, um, Psalm 4610 does not say, um, be quiet and know that I'm God. It says, be still and know that I'm God. So uh, I think that's, that's something that we need to pay attention to. Uh, because I know sometimes, you know, we try to quiet things, but I know that when I intentionally try to be still, it's a different experience. I remember many years ago um, going to uh, the uh, Grand Canyon um, and standing on the South Rim because it was March, <laughs> a little cold. But I noticed that after all of the people taking selfies and you know, I got my husband to quit taking pictures. The stillness emanating from the Grand Canyon was just extraordinary. And so I often, when I go outside, listen for the stillness. You know, unfortunately, um, you know, there are, particularly during the week, I live uh, close to a highway. So it's hard um, to catch that stillness. But uh, I have found that on Sunday morning, that's the stillest day of the week. Um, I believe the stillest day of the year is Christmas morning because most people are inside. Um, but if you, if you start noticing stillness, it's everywhere. But it's us <laughs> and noise pollution. <laughs> that seem to interfere with our being able to connect with it. Um, so one of my favorite things is to just go outside and listen for the stillness and, and you can see it. I know that sounds weird, but if you pay, if you pay attention to a hawk flying across the sky, it is, it, it is a moment of stillness or the clouds passing by. Yes, there's movement, but there's still stillness in the movement. Um, or you can hear stillness in a song. So uh, I, I, ju I just wanted to, to, to uh, mention that. But the question is, so where and how do you meet the presence of God? So Thurman believed that silence was important, but there were many other ways in which you could meet the presence of God. Um, outside, in music, in, um, in the museum, um, you know, all these things he felt that the signature of God was, was written all over the place. Then have you witnessed the healing power of silence, stillness, and solitude? You know, have, have, is there any time when you've noticed um, that these, the, the, this, this has been sort of healing for people? Um, and what forms a group of congregational silence or, and moments of stillness can we introduce into our faith and spiritual communities? I think it is so important. Thurman was way ahead of his time. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we are still in the midst of the contemplative, I call it the contemplative reformation or revolution, sometimes what Maggie and I call it, um, because I think it would be so important um, for us to, you know, to involve some more of that. Um, into our spaces and places. Now, I know that there's usually resistance um, of many sorts. Partly, not everybody's comfortable with silence um, because in silence, not only does the presence um, bubble up, but, but all sorts of uncomfortable feelings and other kinds of issues. So, you know, we often have to be very careful. It's not per perhaps good for people that have recently been in an abusive situation or maybe grieving or whatever. But I think I, I, I keep pushing um, people and in situations into, can we just take a little group silence? And so it's uncomfortable at first, but I think once people begin to really experience the presence in that, that during that time that um, it's, they can begin to see what the benefits are. Um, and, and Thurman even admits that there are some people, he says, 
he, he describes it as their nervous system is so highly or uh, tightly woven that it's hard for them to settle down. Um, but, you know, that's what practice is about. That's what discipline is about, is, you know, really having some control over your mind as opposed to your mind having control over you. So that's just a, a things for us to think about in terms of, you know, how can we perhaps maybe nudge or push for a little bit more um, silence in our congregation. Um, I do know that um, I've had people, you know, spiritual director, I've had people come to me and say, well, you know, my pastor doesn't um, thinks that that meditation stuff is devil worship from the East, um, which obviously is an indication of how ignorant many people are, including some pastors of the contemplative roots of, of Christianity. Um, and uh, it's really unfortunate. Um, I think that there are some people who feel like, well, if you can have a direct experience of God, then you're not going to come to church. But as we'll see uh, on the second half of this, Thurman would believe that the more con contact that you have with God, the more you yearn for community. So, but, you know, we have to work on these things. Um, my bonus questions are, can you spot a contemplative? How do you know when you are in the company of a contemplative leader? What is it about them? Um, or can you not? Maybe you don't know who a contemplative is. Just, just something to think about. So I think that brings us about to our, um, our five minute body break. So we'll take about five minutes uh, for people to get up and do whatever they need to do um, uh, to, uh, to address uh, their bodies, um, what they need, maybe more water or more tea or coffee or whatever it is that um, you need. So we will come uh, back at um, 1120.
I am ready. Thank you. And we're back. All right, <clears throat> if you can just find a comfortable position um, and uh, let these words of Howard Thurman um, sink into your mind and um, feel your heart. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, this sort of transition to, uh, he's gonna prepare us for our transition to becoming an active contemplative. As long as a man has a dream in his heart, he cannot lose the significance of living. That is much insistence upon being practical down to earth. Such things as dreams are wont to be regarded as romantic or as escape hatches for the human spirit. The dream in the heart is the outlet. Men cannot continue long to live if the dream in the heart has perished. It is then that they stop hoping, stop looking, and the last embers of their anticipations fade away. The dream is one with the living water welling up from the very springs of being, nourishing and sustaining all of life. Where there is no dream, the life becomes a swamp, a dreary dead place, and deep within, a man's heart begins to rot. The dream need not be some great and overwhelming plan. It need not be a dramatic picture of what might or must be someday. It need not be a concrete outpouring of a world-shaking possibility of sure fulfillment. Such may be important for some, such may be crucial for a particular moment, of human history, but it is not in these grand ways that the dream nourishes life. The dream is the quiet persistence in the heart that enables a man to ride out the storms of his churning experiences. It is the exciting whisper moving through the aisles of his spirit, answering the monotony of limitless days of dull routine. It is the ever recurring melody in the midst of the broken harmony and harsh discords of human conflict. It is the touch of significance which highlights the ordinary experience, the common event. The dream is no outward thing. It does not take its rise from the environment in which one moves or functions. The dream lives in the inward part. It is deep within where the issues of life and death are ultimately determined. Keep alive the dream, for as long as a man has a dream in his heart, he cannot lose the significance of living. Let us just take a couple of minutes to let that sit with us.
Amen. So let us return to uh, this place where Thurman crosses paths with Rufus Jones. But before um, I uh, st uh, start down that path, let me just mention a couple of things. One is that um, when Howard Thurman was graduating from seminary, he had a wonderful teacher named George Cross. And George Cross was uh, really uh, believed in the, gen the genius of Howard Thurman, that he was just so bright and um, inquisitive and had just such a fine mind. And so uh, just before graduation, he uh, said to, to Howard, he said, hey, um, you know, I don't know exactly what it's like for you um, and your life uh, you know, being, and it, this is, you know, 1920s, you know, being a Negro and all, but I really think that um, the racial problems are social problems and social problems come and go. And if I were you, I would um, devote my life to feeding the timeless hunger of the human spirit. And so Thurman listened to him um, and uh, he, he you know, pondered what he said but he understood that George Cross had no idea what it was like to be a black man in the 1920s. And so I think utilizing what I like to describe as his inner authority, he decided that he wanted to um, <clears throat> pursue both of these issues at the same time. That was, that was the dream in his heart. And so he, uh, you know, set up to uh, go to this church that he had um, been assigned to and, um, you know, to begin his career. But he realized that there was no way that he could separate um, this desire to feed the timeless hunger of the human spirit and the plight of Black people in the United States at the time, they just couldn't be separated. So when he discovered um, Rufus Jones and discovered the book and uh, was able to <clears throat> spend a semester with him, uh, he was thrilled really because Rufus Jones opened up his entire library to him. He also, <clears throat> had him to participate in one of his seminars on mysticism. So Thurman was able to study Meister Eckhart um, and St. Francis of Assisi and St. John the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila and the French uh, quietist uh, Madame Guyon and just everything, everything about mysticism. But was, because what's interesting about both of these men is that they were having mystical experiences before they started the formal study of mysticism. And um, <clears throat> that experience that they had actually informed the ways in which they wrote and studied mysticism. I think uh, th that's sort of important in many ways, um, but what was really important for Thurman was that he did not know up until that time that there was actually a, a foremost uh, study of mysticism in this way. So he was delighted to, to be able to, to spend this time reading and writing and studying. And I think he wrote a paper on um, uh, Francis of Assisi while he was um, there at Haverford. Okay, so one of the things that's um, pertinent to our discussion here is that children, Rufus Jones firmly believed that children, he being one of them, um, have contemplative or mystical experiences. Why? Uh, because children are not, not as absorbed as we are with things and problems and all the other things that seem to pile in into our minds. 
Um, they have more room for surprise and wonder. They're more sensitive to intimations, flashes, and openings. Um, the invisible, he says, the invisible impinges on their souls and they feel its reality as something quite natural. And what's fascinating, what's really important about this is that somehow or other, somewhere along the line, and I think a lot of it has to do with the name, we often um, mix up mysticism, um, you know, derived from mystery, but to something kind of almost unnatural or supernatural or, uh, you know, unusual or happens to only certain people, et cetera. Um, and I think that perhaps um, what happens is, is that we sort of lose our natural connection um, to the presence um, because when we do have experiences, oftentimes uh, parents don't want to talk to their children about it, or they'll say, well, you know, you know, let's save that for some other time or whatever. It's like the reaction that they get when they share those. I know I, I ran into the house one day and said, you know, I was out there and I felt like the sun, the moon and the trees all at once. And, you know, people were looking at me like, girl, are you, what's wrong? Are, have you lost your mind? You know, are you crazy? Right. So I think it's important for us to remember that, you know, children can be great models for the rest of us in, in terms of um, <clears throat> reacquiring that sense of wonder, that sense of openness. Um, sometimes I think people are afraid to have mystical experiences. I've met people, I've worked with people as a spiritual director, companion, who, you know, may have dreams and they're like, they, they don't want them to happen. Um, and I'm like, you know, that dream, that ability to dream like that is a gift. And so when, let's listen to spirit about how that gift can be used as opposed to trying to get rid of it. Um, but people often are afraid of their natural mystical um, inclinations. So one of the things that Rufus Jones did though, was to introduce Thurman to a different way of looking at um, mysticism or mystics. So he felt like that there were affirmation, there's affirmation or negation mysticism. So affirmation mysticism does not require isolation or withdrawal from society or social life. When you go inside to God, you come up into community or oneness. Now, Thurman used the word community in his time to mean oneness or wholeness. Um, and affirmation mysticism stirs a moral or ethical desire to address inequities and restore unity. So there may be something about connecting, something about making contact with this sense of presence. And I know, I'm sure many of you who, who practice centering prayer do have those moments where you lose sense of your body and you feel like you're one with everything. And so uh, Jones believed that there was uh, the sense that there, was, there, there are different kinds of mysticism and the mysticism that he liked to promote was affirmation mysticism. Um, in this idea about mysticism, we also know that mysticism or spirituality is not solely for your own personal spiritual growth. And I think sometimes we get sort of caught up in our own thing about spirituality and about um, our, our spiritual path and walking the spiritual path. But the idea here is that your, your spiritual growth is important because it is linked to the spiritual growth of other people. So the, you know, so once you become spiritually mature, then you are able to mentor other people who are walking the path, perhaps at a different point. So affirmation mysticism would mean some social involvement, that is writing injustices or ending warfare to the idea is to move uh, towards unity. Now, um, Thur Howard Thurman and Rufus Jones would have these private um, meetings, not private meetings, but you know, meetings once a week 
Um, and Thurman found sort of a, a blind spot in uh, just personally with Rufus Jones. And that was that he didn't really have much respect for mysticism and other faith tradition. He was, you know, he was into Christian mystics, mystic, God, I can say it, mystics, but not particularly high on, you know, Hindu or Sufi or other kinds of mystics. Um, he, he was not a fan of, uh, of Gandhi, um, et cetera. And so uh, he, he, Thurman was really not comfortable with that particular approach to mysticism because he felt like it, it wasn't just for Christians, it's for everybody. Um, and then he also found that uh, Jones had difficulty applying affirm affirmative mysticism to domestic issues like racial segregation, um, or, or fight for textile workers um, during that time. So, but, uh, and, and Thurman sort of describes it as, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, he, he says, you know, I basically forgave him for his contradictions and ambivalences. And, it, 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 you know, and he writes something that is just beautiful in um, the, uh, uh, it's, it, it's and it's recounted in this book, uh, Way of the Mystics. Um, these are sermons of um, Howard Thurman about the various mystics that's been published recently by Peter Eisenstadt and Walter L. Fluker. But basically, you know, he says that, you know, I will always love him because he showed me a way, he pointed the way for what I would be studying for the rest of my life. Um, and, you know, so I just had to forgive him of my own negative reactions to this, as, or forgive myself of my negative reactions to, to this idea, as well as, you know, we're all walking contradictions. And, and, and he understood that. So what he decided to do was to come up with, or, or, you know, his own ideas about uh, mysticism. So Thurman had a working definition of mysticism, which was the response of the individual to a personal encounter with God within his or their own spirit. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think he was very comfortable with this kind of practical working definition of it. Now, I have to say that if you can imagine um, in, the, in the early mid, or I should say early to mid thirties, Howard Thurman is talking about mysticism. And people are just up, just, they're like, what? You know, um, why are you talking about mysticism? This is not gonna help us. You know, um, we need somebody who is going to give us some tools for liberation. Um, and, you know, why should we be paying any attention to you? So he was highly criticized, but he kept on writing and kept on talking. Um, he, he also felt that, he needed to rescue mysticism from denigration and ridicule because people, anytime you would mention the word, people would just say, oh, just talk about that. Um, he thought that there was a kind of mysticism that sought to change the world rather than to retreat from it. Um, and he felt that mysticism and social change are distinct concepts, but ultimately inseparable. It sort of sounds like something Thurman would say. So he started giving lectures um, on mysticism and social change um, because he felt that might be a way to usher this in kind of in a different light or a different way so that people could understand that perhaps maybe there could be a connection between mysticism and social change. So his idea was that there were different kinds of mystics um, and he also wanted to change the terminology. So for him, he started using religious experience or encounter with God or a creative encounter um, instead of the word mysticism. Um, because part of the problem was that um, when mystics try to describe in words their experience, um, it would come out cryptic or you know, sounding crazy. And so that was not helping matters at all. Um, so he felt like um, mysticism was really just another form of religion um, and that perhaps religious experience or a creative encounter 
would be better words to use to describe what was going on. He also felt that mystical experiences are not limited to saints, religious, the religious special people or believers, that anyone can be a mystic. Um, and uh, <clears throat> this, you know, this is sort of, th this was not what I was brought up with. You, know, you, you always thought of a mystic as being a person who's um, cloistered, praying all day. And, you know, in the midst of prayer, they have a vision or they have uh, uh, something happens or a dream or whatever. Um, and, you know, th these were chosen people um, and uh, they were, uh, you know, uh, special. Um, so the idea that um, an ordinary person could be a mystic was just not, not entertained at all. So Thurman decided to come up with a, uh, a uh, uh, to, talk, to talk about different types of mystic. He thought, well, maybe part of the problem is that we're lumping a variety of people or different kinds of mysticism into one category. So he said that there were sort of four types. types, um, And <clears throat> there are, are mystics who their, their personal response to God uh, uh, are perceived in personal terms. Um, and uh, Christ mystics were a subset of this, but the idea here is that um, their sense is that God is, is responding to them personally. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of like, you know, God appears to them with a message or they, like I said, they get a vision or something happens and that this is something going on between them and God. Then there was a different type of mystic, and that those were what he called intellectually conceived, an attitude of contemplation. Um, and uh, he had a number of uh, groups in this category, but it's more um, of people who, you know, are trying to really understand the experience. Um, and uh, he, 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 he felt like that there was a, a group that was devoted to just that. Um, and not necessarily devoted to, but that was the, their experience. And then there were um, the light within mystics or the trusting the inner experience. Um, he would probably put um, Rufus Jones and uh, Quaker mystics in this category. Um, and then, you know, there were what he called the psychic insight into matters hidden or the occult sciences. So, you know, there are people out there who, um, you know, apparently have some kind of contact or experience with the beyond or with God in the beyond or whatever. Um, and so he sort of felt like that there was, that, that was its own special kind of uh, mysticism. As far as he was concerned, religious experiences or creative encounters could happen at any time and any place. So oftentimes people sometimes experience it in nature, or it could be doing prayer or meditation, or even at church. Um, and I would say even in hospital rooms. I've been in enough hospital rooms. I've had experiences in hospital rooms. Um, I, and I know that other people have had experiences in hospital rooms where um, something, some presence may appear to them, or they may hear a voice or something. Um, and uh, it certainly has happened to me over the course of many hospitalizations of where, you know, I will hear a voice say to me, this is going to be okay, you just need to get through the, tonight. Um, for him, he felt, though, that a creative encounter should stir an ethical or moral imperative towards restoring our natural state of community, our common unity, living harmoniously with everyone and everything. He, Thurman really felt like naturally, we are naturally connected. There is a sense of wholeness in, in, in the cosmos or in the universe. And that somehow or other, oftentimes, sometimes they are um, uh, 
humanly impose, there is some kind of uh, change to that. So he really felt like that um, uh, there was this harmonious, at some point perhaps, um, connection of everything um, and that moving towards restoring this natural state was important. Um, so Thurman felt like um, mysticism was a special category, it's distinct type kind of religion. Um, and I think, you know, he was writing at, at some of the same times that William James was, um, you know, on sort of, you know, uh, James writing a variety of religious experience, that there was something about uh, it being a, a particular kind of religious experience that it transcended creeds and dogma or religious affiliation. <clears throat> and he considered himself to follow the Quaker light within mystical tradition. That we all have this, we all carry this light within um, and that at any point in time, we can settle down or, or center down into it, um, you know, often um, for guidance. Um, I know that, uh, there's a lovely book called A Testament to Devotion written by Thomas Kelly, who was also mentored by Rufus Jones, Quaker mystic, uh, which I read every year just to remind myself. And he, he talks as well about, you know, when we have all these things going on and we don't know which one to do first and there's so much going on that we need to just pause and just sink down into the light or into God and just listen and we'll be instructed or guided to know what we need to do. Now, <clears throat> there are ways to access this information about Thurman's approach to mysticism. Um, this particular pamphlet is available <clears throat> on Amazon, <clears throat> but it's called Mysticism and the Experience of Love. And basically, um, Thurman's and many of his books have been um, continued to be promoted by um, the Quakers. And this particular is a, a Pendle Hill um, pamphlet, but his, um, <clears throat> his uh, ideas about mysticism, the categories, et cetera, uh, you can read about in this particular publication. <clears throat> Thurman also wrote about um, uh, mysticism in the creative encounter. This was a book that he published in the mid to late 50s, where he really describes um, uh, and, you know, his ideas about um, uh, creative encounters, uh, religious experiences. And what's remarkable about this particular book is that he actually um, suggests that every time we have an encounter, <clears throat> a mystical encounter or a creative encounter, um, it should change us. And he felt like it was changing um, our brains. I mean, he doesn't come out and say brains, but he's really talking neural theology in the late 50s, <laughs> believe it or not. Of course, you know, Thurman being ahead of his times, but that, you know, it should change our, our nervous system, as he sort of describes it, which will change our, um, um, our, <clears throat> our thinking, as well as then later our behavior. <clears throat> okay. He uh, also writes uh, even more, uh, not, I shouldn't say even more, but writes in a different sort of way about um, mysticism um, or creative encounters in the search for common ground. This, this uh, particular um, book was published after um, Martin Luther King Jr. was um, assassinated. He was very interested in so where is it that we can come together? What is the common ground? Um, and he, he spends quite a bit of time. So if you're <clears throat> the philosophical type, like heady stuff, this is the book for you because it is very heavy and heady um, in terms of trying to make the case for our common um, unity. <clears throat> and then finally, um, he writes about um, sort of the disciplines that we need to cultivate in order for us to have more creative encounters. He felt like it was very important um, for us to uh, 
um, create a certain kind of atmosphere, um, perhaps one of silence, one of quiet, so that we can ready the spirit for an encounter with God. He also felt like it was, uh, it was important for us to, um, as mystics, to be committed um, to a discipline of, uh, of activities um, in our daily lives in order for us to then be living out this kind of mystical um, life. <clears throat> and he, he felt that it was extraordinarily important for people to, um, to surrender. Um, he would say that, you know, the, uh, the person who has accepted the mystical life as a way of life um, needs to surrender their nerve center to God. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's a, a, a big challenge. I mean, I've talked to many people who have had mystical experiences or, and I'll ask them, well, are you a mystic? And they'll say, well, I'm not sure if I'm ready to give up that control. And I think that's, that's part of uh, what is difficult for many people is that uh, it's the surrender part. It's like, am I willing to not try to lead anymore and just be led by God or led by spirit? Um, but this particular book comes out of um, some, they, they actually kind of called it a practicum of mysticism that he led um, at, uh, at Boston University um, in terms of, uh, like I said, he liked to do these experiments with uh, either lighting or uh, literature or music, et cetera, and then having people reflect on the kinds of experiences that they were having. Um, you know, this was sort of a compilation of, of some of these, uh, these uh, 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 practices, <clears throat> but that he sort of outlined, these are the practices that uh, he believed that you needed to master in order to really live the mystical life. And then, of course, as I just showed you the sermon series on the mystics, if you are particularly interested in um, uh, what he had to say, he did actually uh, write a, um, give a number of sermons on, on mystics, um, Buddha, St. Augustine, Mahatma Gandhi, St. Francis, William Blake, um, Meister Eckhart, Jane Steger, um, and then he has a related uh, uh, sermons, the religion of the inner life. And I, you know, I could just do a whole probably workshop on what he had to say about the inner life. Um, mysticism and social change, God as presence. And of course, the one that he wrote about um, Rufus Jones as, uh, as well as others in there. So um, they, they are both, um, available in that book, but they're also available. And I, I noticed that um, uh, I think it was Chris that put the, uh, the link to the uh, digital archives. You can actually go and either read or listen to some of these sermons um, on mysticism by, by um, Thurman. Now, so here we're beginning to see how Thurman's sort of contemplative life began to move um, and become more active in the world. <clears throat> so Thurman was invited um, to lead a pilgrimage to India in 1935-36. Um, prior to that, he was writing, um, he, he published an, um, an article called Good News for the Underprivileged, um, which basically he began to write about Jesus as a leader of a nonviolent religion. Um, and as a non-cooperator, this is prior to this trip, um, because he sort of felt like as he was scrutinizing the gospels, that there was something in it. Because his question was, is there anything in the gospels that would speak to those who live on the margins of society um, and who have their backs against the wall? Because like, you know, who are the gospels for? And why would I want to even become a Christian? So he goes to India. He wasn't. He he was not 
interested in in becoming um, in in evangelizing Christianity. As a matter of fact, he was challenged by people in India, particularly one lawyer who asked him, "Why are you here? You know, and why are you representing Christianity? You know, this religion that you." Uh, speak of, you know, doesn't allow you to sit next to other members of the church. It, uh, it stops services to lynch people. Like, what are you doing? And Thurman basically made a distinction and said, well, actually, I'm a follower of the religion of Jesus. Um, like, what was Jesus doing and saying every day? Um, and so he, uh, during this pilgrimage, they, they, he and his wife and another couple, um, William and Fanola Carroll, spent six months in India going around and mainly talking about um, how it was that they were able uh, to, how, how it was that Black people survived in the United States up until that time. Um, they uh, were invited by something that what I would, I would call the YMCA-like, um, because they wanted some dark-skinned people to come and, you know, sort of be Christians, but, you know, uh, help them sort of promote Christianity there. And Thurman's attitude was that Christianity had been in India since the third century. Um, and uh, he wasn't particularly interested in, in sort of the missionary appeal because basically, you know, at the time um, the British were occupying um, India um, and that Christianity had been used for uh, colonizing people and for imperialism. So, you know, he, was, he wasn't big on pr promoting that yet. During this trip, he was had a chance to talk to the uh, Indian poet Tagore and to have a three-hour meeting with um, Mahatma Gandhi. Um, this was an extraordinary meeting. Somebody had, had sense enough to take notes. Um, and uh, it's, it's all in this book, uh, The Pilgrimage, you know, A Vision of the Better World. Uh, Thurman's Pilgrimage um, by Quentin Dixie and Peter Eisenstadt. Um, and, you know, they, uh, uh, Gandhi basically suggested that, you know, Black people, he thought Black people would become Muslim because it was the only religion in which inside the religion, the master and the slave were equal. He said, that's not true of any other religion, but they had a long discussion. Um, Gandhi was very interested in, you know, what had happened. United States. And so Thurman basically gave him sort of a Negro history lesson um, <clears throat> or a Black history lesson. And um, they talked about um, Ahimsa or the sort of, uh, they, they, he really described it as love force as opposed to um, nonviolent, because he didn't really like that non in front of the violent. He'd rather say it, you know, it's really about um, uh, the force of love. Um, and Satyagra, which um, was about, um, you know, non-cooperation. Um, Gandhi encouraged them to start small and work their way up. Um, and um, they, they uh, you know, as they ended, uh, Thurman and uh, uh, his wife and um, the couple sang some spirituals to him. Um, and uh, Gandhi sort of ended with some silence, silent benediction, and, and said, you know, it, it, I'm sure that it's going to be through the American Negroes that the unadulterated message of nonviolence will be introduced to the world, which is in some ways what happened. <laughs> One of the other things that happened to, to Thurman when he was there was that um, he had a vision at Khyber Pass. He saw a caravan of people um, moving into Afghanistan, um, and he felt like he was connected to them. And so one of the things that he wanted to do when he returned to the United States was to see, he wanted to test whether or not people from different uh, denominations, from different spiritual traditions, from different races and ethnic backgrounds could actually worship God in the same place. So when Alfred Fiss wrote him and asked him if he knew of a seminary student who might want to join them in starting this church, um, <clears throat> an intentional interracial, um, interdenominational church, Thurman said, I think I want to do that. And so he basically left his tenure job at Howard University and went to start this church. 
People thought he was nuts. They were crazy. They were in uproar. Um, and, you know, how is he going to feed his family and support them? Because by this time, um, he and his new wife, Sue Bailey Thurman, which, by the way, I just want to say this as an aside, Sue Bailey Thurman and Alberta King were roommates in high school. I, you know, I mean, when I read about that, I, it just took, took my breath away that these two women knew each other long before there was a Martin Luther King Jr. But I digress. Nonetheless, so he went to, um, the, uh, he, he and Alfred Fisk started this church, this, the Church of the Fellowship of All Peoples um, in um, 1943. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, and, and there's a book about the founding of that church. But it was an extraordinary uh, church with all kinds of people attending it. Um, and there is a story of a, a Hindu man who basically told Thurman one day, he says, you know, when I close my eyes, I think I'm in a Hindu temple. So it, it, it was something that Thurman wanted to do to see if in fact this was possible. And of course it was. Um, in 1949, he published Jesus and the Disinherited, and I want to recommend this book to everyone. Everybody, I believe, should read this book. Um, it is not only a book that asks some deep and searing questions about Christianity and what happened to it in terms of how the religion of Jesus became something else, um, but also um, how it is that if you are a member of a marginalized or disinherited a group can find human dignity and the vitality and strength and courage to move against um, your political or social circumstances. Um, and he outlines that, that in this book, um, <clears throat> many of the ideas that can be applied to anybody um, who is, is, is uh, in a, a, a power dynamic, that is, you know, you're operating with someone who has greater power than you, and you start to exhibit some of the characteristics that he noted um, that were the case of, for those who are disinherited. But um, he, he, he thought it was important um, for him to, um, to lay out what it is that he had gathered from studying um, the, the scriptures. Um, this book, of course, uh, at the time, you know, sort of was not well accepted because Thurman was not at a, a college or major college or university. He was black. Um, I mean, he was at this church that was unusual. Um, it was not under a particular denomination. And so people just kind of, some people just kind of didn't pay any attention to it. However, there were people who did. Um, and he sparked this movement. So many activists read and were inspired by Jesus and the disinherited, and they began to, to seek his counsel. Um, so in the civil rights movement, all of these people, um, you know, were moved. Um, and so there was a lot of activity, basically called nonviolent direct action, that occurred um, in, you know, the early 50s um, before, uh, uh, and mostly in northern and, and um, midwestern cities um, where interracial groups would go into a particular location that was, was segregated and just sit down. Um, <clears throat> and of course, um, he crossed paths with Martin Luther King Jr. at um, Boston University. Um, the families knew each other, so they did have some interaction. But by writing this book, and of course, you know, people are still reading it and still being inspired by it. But again, all of this quiet contemplation that he was engaged in, he was utilizing in an outward way to change things. This book, the church, et cetera. So important here, Thurman supported integration, desegregation and racial reconciliation not because he thought it was the right thing to do, but because he knew that one could not have union with God without it. In other words, he was always about oneness, about wholeness, and anything, he felt like anything that interrupted or interfered or kept that, kept people um, apart was a problem. 
um, and that uh, it was keeping all of us from that connection, um, that ultimate long forever connection um, without it. It's like you cannot um, uh, look at other, other parts of the creation and not accept them um, um, and expect to then be reconciled or reconnected to God. It's all one, it's all part of the oneness. So it brings us to um, some questions that we may want to sit with as well in the coming days. And that is, how would you define mystic or mysticism? You know, in what ways do you think about it? Um, is it, you know, for you a creative encounter or um, is it something that's very personal to you? Um, and are you free to discuss it? Uh, one of the things that I've discovered as a spiritual director companion is that there are many people who are, I call them covert or closet mystics. They are afraid to discuss it. Um, and in doing these retreats and workshops, I've had people email me and say, you know, I think I'm a mystic, but I don't know for sure. And is that okay? And as I've talked with them, I found that there are lots of pastors, priests, imams, religious leaders who refuse to talk to people about their mystical experiences. They were either changed the subject or say, we're not going to talk about that, or that's devil worship from the East or whatever. Um, and so those people are just kind of left hanging, uh, wondering. Uh, and with one person, um, I asked her if you know she had talked to anybody in her family. And she said, yes, I've talked to my grandmother who also have had mystical experiences, but she's not a religious authority. <laughs> so we had to sort of unpack that. <laughs> but the idea is, are we still having difficulty allowing people to be mystics? And then, um, you know, have, we ha have you had these encounters? When are they most likely to occur? And what else has come out of it? Has it just been, wow, I just had this experience with God? Or was it, did it lead to some opening, some sense of I need to think about this more or there, there, God is calling me. Um, Thurman would say often, you know, if you're a mystic, you know, and you meet God, God has something for you to do. And so it's really beginning to sort of open up that, well, so what is your sacred calling? You know, what is God inviting you to do to, to, to restore things? And then of course, who and what do you think your spiritual growth is for? We often think it's just for us. And I think Thurman would, would say, well, no, maybe not. Um, maybe your spiritual growth is for something more than just you. And so what are you gonna do about that? He would say that we each are called we each have a sacred call um, and that we can live our sacred call as scary as that might be with inner authority of the spirit. The movement of the spirit of God in the hearts of men and women often causes them to act against the spirit of their times or causes them to anticipate a spirit which is yet in the making. In a moment of dedication, they are given wisdom and courage to dare a deed that challenges and to kindle a hope that inspires. So Thurman would suggest that <clears throat> utilizing one's inner authority, that is that you know what you are supposed to be doing. Um, even though there may be people around you who are criticizing you and telling you, oh, you don't wanna do that. Um, you know, it, it's like that inner knowingness. Um, and I know that the more that I sit and practice, you know, that I spend time for silence every day, the more that I can hear spirit speaking to me about what I need to do. You know, I may say, oh, I'm going to do such and such. And people will say, well, why are you going to do that? And then, right. And I just go back to that space, to the spirit and say, so what is it that you're calling me to do in this moment? 
um, and, and do that. And I find that when I do that, the outcome is much better than if I'm willing to um, let somebody else change my mind. Thurman's perennial questions, who are you? What do you want really? And who and what are you rooted in? These are really important questions. He felt like that oftentimes we do not have an accurate, portray, uh, no, accurate concept of who we are because we've been given a lot of our self-concept. It's been given to us um, and it's not always positive. And so it's important to examine that. What do you want, really? What do you want? And who and what are you rooted in? Rooted in spirit? Are you rooted in the world? Where are you rooted? He felt, of course, the famous line from um, Meister Eckhart, you can only spin in good works what you've earned in contemplation, um, which I think we all know. As you are living your sacred call, befriend silence, stillness and solitude, seek and bask in the divine presence as often as you can, acquaint yourself with your inner life. What do you know about your inner life? Who's in control of your inner life? One of the famous lines from Jesus of the Disinherited is that if a person knows what epithet or insult to hurl at you to throw you off your equilibrium, they will always be in control of you. So do you have control of your inner life and inviting the spirit in for inner authority? You can do some of the most daring things if in fact you know that spirit is with you in that moment. It's a great example of an active, I know that sounds a little strange, active con contemplative, but they work. Each person is called to assume their role in the restoration of God's beloved creation. So sometimes we get kidnapped by uh, that scripture from Matthew. Um, <clears throat> uh, I just lost it a second. Uh, oh, many are called, but few are chosen. Um, how about all are called, few choose to listen? So I think we're ready for questions and conversation. Wow, thank you, Larita, so inspiring. So um, how we're gonna do this is have people raise your hand. If you, um, at the bottom of your screen, there's a raise hand, I think it's under reactions, and that will put you in line. Um, but I, what I wanted to, call on Lynn Huber um, first. And so we'll let you be able to unmute yourself and then mute yourself back when you're done. But Lynn had a, if you saw it in the chat, go back. As a prayer and as a spiritual director, I often encounter what might be called mystical experiences. I usually do not use the word mystic or mystical, though some do, and I affirm that when it seems right. Question, is it important to use that word itself or find to just affirm that the experience is of God, the test for me being whether it leads you deeper into your clear call? So uh, I, I think it all depends on <clears throat> who you are talking with and their responses to the word mystic or mystical or mysticism. Um, as we noted with Thurman, he decided not to use those terms anymore. So, you know, after those early uh, uh, lectures that he gave on mysticism, he started using religious experience or creative encounter for those very reasons. So um, I, I think that terminology to some makes a difference. And if it does, then you can use his terminology or you can use another kind of terminology. It just depends on what, you know, you, it's, spirit can guide you in that in terms of what, what might be the most appropriate terms. Some Thank people are comfortable with mis mysticism, other people are not. Thank you for that. And thank you for this wonderful time.
You're very welcome. I'd say hello to my Colorado. I used to live there. <laughs> well, and it. that that's what I call our our um centering prayer friends. I call them fellow mystics. So Yes, and I some, that. some people some people are put off by it, but I think if you name it, that's what it is. It's something new. So anyone else have a comment or a question? Okay, Stephen. Unmute, unmute yourself, Stephen. <clears throat> I think we're enabling that or disabling that. Is okay. Our, okay, good. Um, Maria, this is just a, a beautiful, friendly uh, introduction to Howard Thurman. Um, I, uh, I was fortunate, I was blessed to pastor in Daytona Beach uh, in the 90s. And I used to uh, drive by his house uh, often, and uh, I've never been able to get inside, but I'd peek through the windows, and I know the tree you're talking about. And I'm so grateful uh, to Maggie for introducing us, because I first met you uh, through uh, at the early stages of the pandemic. Um, and uh, so th this is extra. I would. This is a beautiful way, it seems to me, to introduce people to Howard Thurman, who is greatly uh, a, a, a great resource. And being from Florida, we, I'm very proud to claim him as a Florida mystic. Uh, <laughs> so my question, you, uh, the first time I met you, you mentioned and you introduced me to a person, I believe his name is Gregory Ellis. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seemed to me as it, 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 he is one person that is really fully engaged in the what next, how do you go from uh, the mystical experience to fostering community and uh, his uh, work in fearless dialogue, how do you speak out of this and uh, have I would be interested in your perspective on how that's going. Um, Gregory Ellison, Professor Gregory Ellison, he's at uh, <coughs> Candler, um, and he's been doing some great work um, in trying to create a space and a place to put Howard Thurman's ideas into practice. Right. Uh, and so he, uh, I think, is still engaged in the fearless dialogues. He also has a edited volume um, anchored in the current, that's that should be on the bibliography that you'll be receiving if you don't already have it. Um, as a you know, as a, a group of, of people that he brought together to write about Thurman um, in in a, in a ver variety of ways. I think there are a lot of people who are trying to um, find ways to uh, put this kind of thinking into practice. Um, because it's so badly needed right now. Um, but I think that each, like I said, each of us has a, a has a call. And uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm happy for anyone who's doing work as sort of the generation of the scholars, that is, you know, people like Peter Eisenstadt, uh, Walter Earl Fluker, and um, Luther Smith Jr. are getting older, really, but they were the ones who had to tarry in the you know, had to listen to the transcriptions and read the read the personal correspondence, et cetera, all of that. They've compiled that for people coming along. I, I don't know why I'm ex excluding myself from that group because I'm no, no, no. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, so so it's um I I I am applauding anybody who is doing anything to to not only expose Thurman, because there's still a lot of people who don't know anything about it. I mean, like me, I mean, I was like, you know, 50, past 50s, you know, almost before I learned about him. And I'm like thinking, why is that? This is, there's a problem. There's something wrong with this picture, which is why. And then I was, you know, I, this is why I wrote a book, right? To, to get more people to be able to be exposed to him and his work. Well, I would just say thank you for that. And, and to me, yes, uh, my sense of, felt need right now are friendly introductions, not just to Howard Thurman, 
but regardless of what vocabulary you choose to use to to the <clears throat> sources available in mysticism um, and to things that are uh, uh, friendly uh, to use to people with no idea and even not to uh, like-minded people uh, but uh, for for those that we may our differences may seem more obvious than our commonalities to find that underlying unity. So thank you very, very much. You're welcome. And I mean, I'm not trying to shamelessly plug my book, but it is a friendly introduction to Thurman. Yeah, yeah. There was a question, I think somebody's got their hand up over here. Who is this, David? David, I know this person. <laughs> David from Atlanta and Stephen went to Candler. So it's all one big family. Oh, David. Hi. Um, first of all, just thank you, Larita. I always think I know a little bit about Howard Thurman, and then I listen to you talk, and I learn so much more. Um, and um, uh, thank you to Maggie and the Contemplative Outreach Atlanta folks for, for putting this on. I, I particularly appreciated a couple of things, that the concept of affirmation mysticism from Rufus Jones and then the fact that, you know, Thurman would get into dialogues with his white teachers and they would say, well, you know, you should. And or they couldn't quite go where he needed to go. And he was able to say, OK, this person taught me this, but I know what is right. He had that inner authority that he knew this had to go to a certain place and, and we all are beneficiaries of it. Um, uh, the quotation, I clipped a couple of the quotations off the, off the screen, uh, uh, the movement of the spirit of God in the hearts of men and women often calls them to act against the spirit of their times, et cetera. I'm, I'm of the belief, the hope, at any rate, that you know, there's a famous saying, quotation that the the Christian of the future will be a mystic or will not exist at all. Uh, Karl Rahner, I think, the theologian, uh, I'm convinced that this future mystical Christian will also be a countercultural Christian. Um, and I think Thurman highlights this connection between mysticism and countercultural action and not you know the, the christian of the future is all going to you know drop off and live in a, a commune in northern new mexico which is a great place to live um but that the christian of the future will be in opposition to many of what are considered the obvious things uh of of society um and i i, I appreciate your helping here depict that bridge from what he learned from the, the Quaker tradition uh, into uh, this radical social change calling that, that grew out of it, and which to me, that's right back to the New Testament. That's, that's my lecture for another time. Thank you, David, because, you know, Thurman believed that Jesus was a mystic. And, um, you know, yes, the, the, the Christian of the future uh, uh, will be a mystic or not at all. That's, that's the Carl Reiner's um, quote. <clears throat> because if we were acting like Jesus, it wouldn't be having these problems, if you understand what I'm saying. So, so it's really uh, a moving towards you know, sort of, sort of a kind of a more authentic Christianity, where we are being like Jesus, like he was every day in, in terms of how he dealt with people. And, uh, you know, uh, Thurman at one point uh, talks about when we love, we need to love aspirationally, as Jesus did, you know, and, and sort of says that we need to, to act towards the person as if they as if they should be, as opposed to how they're at behaving in the moment. It's challenging stuff, but it can be put into practice. It's difficult. 
you know, I mean, or to live as a holy child of God. But, you know, if you're if you choose to live as a holy child of God, that means that everybody else is a holy child of God and you need to be treating them accordingly. So it's it's work. It's discipline. It's um, I think what the contemplation does is it, 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 it brings it into our awareness, you know, so that it's more conscious and that we can be more conscious in our behavior. Uh, but uh, but once that you are aware of it, then you are being called to practice those kinds of things. So yes, I, I, I agree with you in, in that sense. Do we have time for any more questions? Another um, question? We, we have two more, <laughs> Benedict. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to Maggie for putting this on and thank you for Lerita for a wonderful presentation. Um, I come from the contemplative outreach of uh, Maryland and Washington. Um, um, what I wanted, what I came to think about uh, in terms of both uh, Lerita's responses, but also the questions on the mystics or not, or how to uh, characterize how a sermon is, that a, a very good word is prophet. And, and prophet is um, sort of in the sense, as also has been discussed by Richard Rohr in his daily meditations uh, at the beginning of this year. Every, every day there was something on what it means to be a prophet, and he called on people to be prophet, not so as to predict what will happen in the future, but it is one who is truth saying, not always telling people what they want to hear, but is still by by uh, the the preaching sayings is uh, helping move forward the development and change in the world towards a better world. So and, and that is, I think, what Howard Thurman was and what he still, in a sense, can exemplify for us. So I just wanted to add that. Um, yes. Well, so he was, he's been described as both a prophet and a mystic, right? So <clears throat> if you think about sort of the, the prophet part, um, prophets oftentimes would make comments about uh, sort of the status quo and say, uh, there's something wrong with this picture or I think we need to be doing such and such. And by the way, there is also in this series of sermons um, that I mentioned, volume one is uh, actually about the, his sermons on the prophets. So uh, he has a sermon series on the prophets. Um, and, you know, prophets used to call out stuff. They would just call it out. And, uh, and, so, so you, so, so you've got prophets, but you've also got mystics who, because they know God, they don't have to follow the rules. They're not worried about the rules. They're not worried about the creeds. They're not worried about the dogma. They are living from God. That's how they live. And, you know, whether you like it or not. So you have sort of, you know, and maybe they're are mystic prophets. I'm not quite sure. Some people have described Thurman as a uh, mystic activist. You know, so you've got all these different terms. Um, and I don't think it really, the terminology is important as it is that you have people walking around who under, have a deeper understanding of what's really going on and are not caught up in all the stuff about one's denomination being better than another or one's uh, spirituality being better than another, uh, none of that, because they, they know that God would not want any of that. That it's really always about what is going to bring me closer to God and what is going to help me to help others uh, be aware of the presence of God. So, you know, all this other stuff is just kind of stuff. Um, so prophet, mystic, theologian, I mean, you, know, you could go down the line of, uh, you know, all the different uh, uh, words, but uh, but but Thurman would also be in the profit category as well. Yes, <clears throat> I think we have another question here from Ju yes. Julie. Yes, go Julie. 
Okay, thank you so much for this wonderful information. I too am a Candler alumni and student of Dr. Luther Smith. And, uh, but my curiosity is on the church that was created. Wondered if Thurman's church is still operating and whether, what can we do as churches today to implement some of those same ideas and how will that, or could that move us into some radical reconciliation? So yes, the church, uh, the Fellowship Church is still in existence in San Francisco. I, I don't think it, it has the same um, balance, if you know what I mean, sort of ethnic and racial balance as it did when Thurman was there, because you know, Thurman was very charismatic. Some people described him as a modern day shaman, really. So, you know, you have people that come in, they're charismatic and, and they can just do things in a way that, you know, other people can't, right? But that's not to say that the church is still, is still there and people are still attending um, and they've got an active congregation. <clears throat> in terms of what can we do, and that's why I put that question up about in what ways can we start to introduce um, more congregational silence. So I, I want to challenge all of you contemplative outreach folks who belong to congregations to start nudging and moving people towards that. Perhaps maybe you might want to have a centering prayer group just before a service, a worship service, um, so that you're really kind of I don't want to say subversively, but you're kind of working in a meditation time, you know, sort of before the service um, and, uh, you know, trying to, you know, trying to bring people to that so that <clears throat> at some point the congregation wants it. And the pastor who may be resisting can't resist anymore, right? So, um, so, you know, and, and I was listening to a, Thurman, uh, a, a sermon by Thurman the other day about the Essenes. <clears throat> and he says, you know, people criticize the Essenes for going off to the desert. And he said, but they were very subversive. He said they were there doing the prayer and the meditation and the quiet and the stillness and all of that, because what they wanted to do was to get up under the foundation and, sh and shake it a little bit. Right. So I, and I know and I'm sure many of you know that once you start something like that, for example, many years ago, <clears throat> when I was still teaching. I started a Friends of Silence group on campus for faculty and staff. And, you know, we would meet. I don't know if it was once a week or, you know, once every other week. I don't know when it was, but we would meet um, and we would check in and then sit for 20 minutes. And I swear there are people that would go on sabbatical and come back and say, you know, I went on a retreat and now, so can I join your group, right? So it's almost as if by us meeting together, we were doing something. I can't describe it. I don't know what it is, but I think that if we start to, um, with our own inner authority or in consultation with the spirit, start creating spaces and places to introduce more silence, congregational silence or group silence, um, even into the building, that it will shake things up. I, that's my own personal opinion. And I think Thurman knew that. Other, uh, other questions? We have one question <clears throat> from Ella in the chat, and I'm trying to find it. Um, it seems like... Well, Thurman broke out of all religious categories. Was he ever accused of being an atheist or against Christianity or against the U.S., like Dr. King's CIA stuff? <clears throat> well, I'm sure that the FBI had a file on Thurman. I'm sure they did. Yeah. It, it, the other <laughs> thing that's part of that, I think, is my question. Um, I was really struck by how he convinced Dr. King not to use nonviolence as a tactic, as a political tactic, but more as a way, you know, a satyagraha, more as a way of being. Well, 
I, like I said, Thurman, by the time King came along, Thurman had been writing and sort of uh, pondering and working on this idea of non-cooperation um, for like 30 years, 20 years. And so, uh, and there was already things happening, right? So there's a lovely book called Nonviolence Before King um, written by Anthony Syracuse. It came out last year, I think. You know, about all, and he highlights Thurman as really sort of like the godfather of getting stuff going, right? And then all these other kinds of things, campaigns that were going on. So King was actually joining something that had already started, but <clears throat> because the situation was so bad in the South, he actually um, is sort of, you know, and he was out there. I mean, you know, there's just, that's just the way it goes. I mean, sometimes people are sort of anointed or crowned or whatever you want to call it, you know, and when, when in fact, there's lots of people participating in a movement like that. So, but that's okay. Cause Thurman was not into self-promotion. He was living for God. He said, you know, when I was born, I think God put a coal in my heart and I was his man. There was no escape. That was his quote, right? So he was working for God. He wasn't working for, and he said that you know, he got criticized for not marching. He was at the, the, the March on Washington, but as a, as a participant, not as a person speaking, you know, and he was happy to see these young people fresh out of jail, you know, <laughs> so he, he wrote about it. It was, just, it was just a beautiful thing, but he, he felt like that politics was not his thing, that it would take away from his call to feed the hunger of the, of the human spirit, right? He was holding the space, the spiritual space for others to come. He would counsel with them, et cetera, right? So that was, he knew that was his role. So, you know, everybody has a, everybody has a call. Everybody has a role. And he, he tried to encourage every person that he talked to, you know, like, who are you and why are you here? And what are you, what are you being called to here? Right? So that was really important. Um, but there are people who believe that uh, by the end, Thurman had transcended Christianity, right? I want, he was not an atheist. He believed in God for real. I mean, you know, but he would say things like, you know, he would call Jesus the master, but he would say, um, I, I would pray to God and talk with Jesus. So uh, he, you know, he, I think he had uh, sort of a radical form of Christianity, if we want to call it that. But he, he said, I'm a follower of the religion of Jesus. And he stuck to that. So, um, yeah, I think he, some people said that he transcended Christianity. And I don't even know what you call that. You know, I'm not sure if there's a word for that. But, but that, uh, and, and that's what mystics sometimes do. They're like, they realize, oh, I don't really need all this structure and all these, this other stuff. You know, I know that I can be, you know, he, he basically would say that if you're if um, if you're not at home someplace, you can't be at home any place in terms of church. Right. So that, you know, you go and you, you know, you worship with people who may be worshiping differently, but they're still worshiping the same God. So so no, no way, not agnostic, not atheist. No, he was definitely a man of God. Well, and we see the others that that seem <clears throat> transcended. I mean, people thought Thomas Merton quit being a monk. He never quit. And and Keating talked about our oneness. You know, it's it's passing boundaries. Basically. Right. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, I, I want to. Can I end with a, a meditation by him? Please. OK, I have this lovely meditation that I want to play. One of my favorites. <clears throat> and um, I want to end us with this. Now, it's going to take me a minute to get to it because it's embedded in a sermon. So just give me a, give me a moment. I'm going to try to see if I can catch it. So. Give me the strength to be free. The thought of being free comes upon us sometimes with such power that under its impact, we lose the meaning that the thought implies. 
Often being free means to be where we are not at the moment, to be relieved of a particular set of chores or responsibilities that are bearing heavily upon our mind, to be surrounded by a careless rapture with no reminders of cost of any kind, to be on the open road with nothing overhead but the blue sky and the whole day in which to roam, for many, being free means movement, change, reordering. To be free may not mean any of these things. It may not involve a single change in a single circumstance, or it may not extend beyond one's own gate, beyond the four walls in the midst of which all of one's working hours and endless nights are spent. It may mean no species from the old familiar routine and the perennial cares which have become one's persistent lot. Quite possibly, your days mean the deepening of your rut, the increasing of your monotony, and the enlargement of the areas of your dullness. All of this and more may be true for you. Give me the strength to be free. Often to be free means the ability to deal with the realities of one's situation so as not to be overcome by them. It is a manifestation of a quality of being and living that results not only from understanding of one's own situation, but also from wisdom in dealing with it. It takes no strength to give up to accept shackles of circumstance so that they become shackles of soul, to shrug the shoulders and bland acquiescence. This is easy, but do not congratulate yourself that you solved anything. In simple language, you have sold out, surrendered, given up. It takes strength to affirm the high prerogative of your spirit, and you will find that if you do, a host of invisible angels will wing to your defense and the glory of the living God will envelop your surroundings because in you, he has come into his own. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Larita, for your beautiful presentation. Thank you to John and Chris, our wonderful Zoom admins. We couldn't do it without you. We've had some requests for um, the to get the links to the meditations you played, Larita, and the slideshow. If that's possible, it's going to be recorded and we're going to post it on the YouTube channel. So um, we can send it to you if you can like. Send it. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you so much for listening. Appreciate it. Getting up on Saturday morning. Grateful, Lorita. Thank you, everyone.